All right, then without further ado, um, Niklas, um, you have the rights to share screen and everything. You're ready to go. Sure. Um, for what time should I aim? Similar, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes talk and then discussion? I think 10 minutes is perfect. Then we have enough time for questions. Okay. I need to, can't share the screen yet. You should be able now. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so I haven't prepared for making this uh, 10 minutes. It was for a bit longer presentation, but I'll try to sort of make it concise. Right, so um, I'm aimed in this talk to bring together the concept of network states and startup cities and show how it can accelerate technological progress in the real world. So I realized that's you know a bit of a take that not everyone agrees with. Um, sort of what's the interpretation of Balaji's book, right? So networks today, Kylie and Light on the community and so on and so forth. So there seems to be a bit of a confusion sometimes. So some people think it's kind of a Discord server on steroids or something like that, where you like stay online for a while. But my tag is really, no, we're building new cities, right? And there's a large movement and that is very much connected to that idea that includes Balaji himself, right? So he's talking about cities He's concretely mentioning crowdfunding territories and communities and, you know, quoting examples like Prosper or Cul-de-Sac that are doing exactly that, right? So I discussed this with Patrick Friedman. I'm not going to go into that, but he's, um, they're working together, right? So Balaji is an advisor with him and he pretty much agreed with me that the network state is kind of a strategy innovation um, that sort of connects with the charter cities and the seasteading space, right? So I'm not going to play that. Um, but sort of based on that, I created that new cities industry landscape. So in my interpretation, startup cities are kind of one endpoint, right? Sort of to bring governance innovation to um, sort of enforce um, governance in the real world, right? So the online layer in network states is just a strategy for how to get started, right? So, and sort of co-living is living sort of in between. Right, or it's, it's kind of a bit of a network state light strategy. So co-living is using existing legal guardrails to realize a certain moral innovation. So I kind of want to distinguish it a bit from network states like Afropolitan Praxis that have the expressed goal of building a real city where co-living that's typically not the case, even though these projects can also be very ambitious and want to fundamentally rethink the way we, we live. And there's a couple of layers of infrastructure um, that are built to support that ecosystem and a couple of foundations and institutes that are promoting that idea. Um, I think the two clearest example of these two strategies, sort of the network state approach, Afropolitan praxis is one, sort of start online with an aligned community and then kind of have a strategy to develop your own service economy online, your own cryptocurrency, and you know, both Praxis and Afropolitan are already negotiating with existing jurisdictions and governments to get the space where to build cities or Afro towns in the real world. So that's just a point that comes a bit later in their journey. And Prospera is kind of the zero to one in the space. I live there myself, right? So it has the full stack of like governance services and land and real estate and laws and regulations. And so it's already possible to move into um, a place that has a lot of governance innovation. To tie it kind of together a bit, so I think governance innovation is really the big goal of this. So if governance was an industry, it would be 30% of world GDP. I'm going to rush a bit through this, but it's kind of the key a goal vector of this whole space is to change governance, to really upgrade humanity, right? So to create the conditions for better economics, for better development. There's something that I call a full stack, right? So that's kind of the end state, right? So you have laws and regulations, governance services, land and real estate. That's kind of the components of a country, if you will, right? So if you have all these three, you could call yourself a startup city in my terminology, like Prospera. And the innovation that Spalaji is bringing into the space is he wants to reduce the barriers to entry for new startups, right? So places like Prospera and Kwashi or C Morazan, they're more expensive to start, right? So Sira Morazan is started by a 
um, industrialist, right? So he has the capital to easily invest 12 million in the first iteration. Prosper itself has raised more than 100, 150 million in funding, right? And Kwashi required deep connections into the Zambian government, right? As do most of these models here. So they're very hard to start, even though they're much easier to start than what was previously city building that cost hundreds of millions. But then the network state model is basically saying, hey, if you don't yet have these connections and deep pockets, you can start earlier. You can start with an online community and then develop the full stack later. So I think in many ways that has its advantages. But you know, if you already have the kinds of connections to start with the jurisdiction, that also has its advantages, right? So there's pros and cons to each strategy. And I'm totally agnostic to which strategy is working out better. What's definitely true is, you know, that these charter city style, that these charter cities are more advanced, right? So these effort and practices, there are more new startups on the starting line, right? So I have a bit of a taxonomy, how to see these, how to view these network states slash startup cities and what's kind of um, important to understand about them or the direction which they go, right? So they could be a bit more like Disney World where you have like, like a hundred percent curated product and like, like kind of a, like a plant economy, if you will, they could be a bit more like, or it could be more like Burning Man, uh, like Blackboard City, which is a hundred percent emergent economy that's zero planned, right? So in that terminology, um, places like Nkwashi or Marazan are a bit more planned, right? So, and Prospera has a bit more, ha has much more free market, right? So they don't have a master plan that's like a, similar to zoning, they actually have it more as a guidance for developers to come in and co-create, right? So, but Prosper is a very free market oriented model. The second one is the degree of autonomy that you have. So you can be a government led zone. So it means you have zero independence or you can be your own country. And there's multiple degrees in between. You can have special economic zones or free zones. So Panama has a lot, Costa Rica, Uruguay are examples with different degrees of legal autonomy. And Honduras has the best framework in the world to have a very high degree of legal autonomy. It can also differ in terms of what you want to optimize for. So I think the in the middle is sort of this globalized and regulated existing jurisdictions. So for some people, they're aiming to more self-sustenance, more rural ruralism, more escapism and self-sufficiency. So Aleph Citadel is a great example there in Argentina and like total Bitcoin maxis, don't know crypto scams and whatever, and kind of, you know, living on the countryside, sort of where the government can't reach us and stuff like that. Whereas Afropolitan or Prosper are kind of more hyper-integrated network stage slash startup cities that want to create something like a Dubai or Hong Kong that's fundamentally sort of integrated with the world economy. And I would argue that someone like Afropolitan would push it even further with doing things like citizen passes and creating their own embassies that would sort of allow people from anywhere in the world to be part of this um, sort of network state, right? So I do agree that, you know, Prospera doesn't have all the components or pushing the boundaries as much um, yet as we could or we want to see in the space, but it's definitely a vector that's trending in that direction. So, you know, I wouldn't disagree, hey, maybe we don't yet have an act network state but we could call it network state startups right so this brings us back to this landscape um and this, i'm happy to discuss this what you like about it or don't like um just caveats i'm excluding innovative jurisdictions these are like corporate innovation to me so i did not doing enough even though they can sometimes realize breakthrough innovations like estonia did and there's also private cities so these are also kind of existing players and not really new startups. So I have a bit of a bias because I'm a VC. So I look at this like an emerging startup industry and not like as kind of a, hey, this is like the like a clean categorization of, of everything. Yeah, with that said, technological progress. So why what do I why do I think these places could accelerate technological progress? So I really like Balaji's quote. Bits reopen innovation in atoms. Innovation areas like biomedicine, robotics, and energy is not upstream of the network state, it's downstream of it. So I really think these places can sort of end a stagnation we see in many areas and lead to superabundance. So just a thought experiment is if we had 2% productive economic growth, 
then our world GDP would increase by 7.5 times in 100 years. We don't have 2% productive economic growth right now. I think we're on a declining trajectory when it comes to that. We're at best at 1, 1.5, maybe even lower, right? So I think the way these statistics sometimes are done is also not correct. But assuming we are at 2%, that's what we lead up to. If we increase that to 5%, we could 130x the whole world's GDP, and that would really be super abundance. That would sort of advance humanity to a whole new level that we can't even think about yet how that would look like. And I think the levers to reach that are doable, right? So again, I mean, we see, I'm looking at different industries and startups and how they could disrupt this. So I'm just thinking through how could changing the base layers, the regulatory structure for these industries sort of lead to this additional growth. And I think it's well possible, right? So a mixture of health, housing, energy, transport, finance, and education could lead to a one to 2% plus in the growth rate. I think the biggest innovation would be open borders and sort of to a full degree or to a lesser degree, but definitely something in that direction because the labor market is sort of the biggest in the world. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but in healthcare, we have something like E-Rooms Law. So the rate of innovation and in new drug development is basically the reverse of Moore's Law, right? So where Moore's Law um, increased computing power every two years, the opposite is happening in drug development. Right, so that's a failure of the regulatory state. Same in housing. So if we had the same housing policies as Tokyo, we could save 75% on housing in like New York and London in um, San Francisco and all that. Same in energy. So if we'd got nuclear power, we would be on an escape velocity when it comes to all sorts of other technologies like nanorobots and things like that. So energy is really the area that a lot of other areas depend on. So if we can get energy um, accelerated innovation back, that would enable a lot of other areas. And transport is also an area that has been stagnating a lot. So airline speeds, for example, haven't increased in more than 50 years. And the reason is just one regulation by the FAA in the United States that says, well, airline speed is regulated and not noise, <laughs> right? So it's completely artificial. In finance, that's a bigger topic. It's hard for me to estimate, but I think separating state and money would be a good idea. It could be a massive multiplier and reducing inflation at the risk of default and financial collapse. Education is also very hard to estimate, but the positive impact could be ranging from saving tons of money that's wasted right now. So that if we're massively increasing spending on education um, without having any impact to like escape velocity and scientific progress, right? So centralized science funding is a very bad idea. So the rate of disruptive science that is really transformative is going down. So doing it that better could have escape velocity potential. And last but not least, open borders. So the economists estimate that if we had a completely free labor market where someone from Haiti owning like $500 in Haiti um, could sort of 20x their income by going to a place like the United States. So just having a more flexible global labor market would be by far the biggest innovation. And I think it's also where these zones can help. I'm not going to go through that, but you could have something like for-profit refugee cities. So there's already an alliance called the SDZ Alliance that's thinking about that model and where you could implement it in Africa. So having the physical space with new governance, hey, we do it for profit, anyone is... Uh, welcome that is able and willing to contribute, that would be a major innovation, similar in sort of power for economic development like Shenzhen in China, right? So, and the way to unlock all this is having a better regulatory system or structure. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I think Balaji is very well aware and talking about these regulatory innovations that are needed. I think what is the winning candidate for better regulations that would allow all these other industries to thrive is Tom W. Bell's ULEX, which is polycentric law. So it's something that requires a bit of context of talking about, but you can find an episode on my podcast, sort of that polycentric law coupled with a competitive insurance market for risk assessment, in my mind, is I think the winning candidate, which is why I'm so excited about Prospera and about sort of realizing much real world innovation there. So there's already a couple of companies in Prosper that do gene therapy, drone logistics, robotic construction, and basically you know, getting a banking license without the lender of last resort model, right? So that's a massive regulatory innovation. 
yeah so generally there's three industries that i think have the biggest the most to gain right now right so it's not something in the future you can already do it right so there's already a couple of places where you can do clinical trials where you can do drones hopefully small-scale nuclear at some point even though that's a pr challenge mostly and there's also tons of jurisdictions that are crypto friendly where we can do things like security token and sales much more easily one industry that i'm particularly passionate about is insurance so I think there is a massive low-hanging fruit that is not realized through bad regulations when it comes to insurance, right? There's, right now, if you're doing a startup in any of these places, you can find like a physical sandbox to, to do some of these things in the real world that you can't do or just very hard to do anywhere else because of like permitting and stuff like that. There's the whole legal innovation side when it comes to jurisdictional wrappers. So there's a couple of other jurisdictions besides Wyoming, for example, the Catawba Digital Economic Zone, or the Marshall Islands, or, well, Prospera, where you have uh, legally recognized rights as a DAO, right? And that is kind of a legal innovation and template that can scale to other jurisdictions. In drones, for example, we are negotiating right now with Colombia and Brazil to do the same regulation that we did in Prospera, because we have a company that's already doing that there. And last but not least, you have early adopter communities in some of these cities, right, that want this kind of tech, right? So we're talking about, for example, 3D property rights in the air, right? So you can much more easily create a market where it would be easier for drone startups to scale, for example. Medical tourism can be a big industry and you have like communities that are very tech forward and want these things to happen. Yeah, so in my own interest, I have a podcast where I talk a lot about that with some thought leaders in the industry and some of these entrepreneurs. And I have a VC that is a micro fund. I made the first seven investments and I'm planning because it was very successful so far to do a bigger fund too, potentially one crypto fund and one traditional equity fund to kind of supercharge this movement. And I also do events. Two of them are in Prospera. The other one is in the network state experiments by Vitalik Buterin in Montenegro, which is where I am right now. So feel free to join for any of the events and see it yourself. Was that 10 minutes? Almost, but great presentation. Almost. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Nicholas. I'm really sure. impressed, Nicholas. Honestly, I never saw someone who has such a clear, uh, rational view on the movement. So I'm really impressed. Thanks. Mm -hmm.